A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness. He will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt. and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So about a year and a half ago, a friend of ours had a dog who had a, a litter of puppies, and they were Chowinis, which I understand are half Shih Tzu, half Dachshund, and they were looking for friends to adopt them. And I'm not sure why, but apparently two dogs were not enough for our household, and I got outvoted, and we gained a puppy, as did uh, my mother and father-in-law who retired and moved to our area a couple years ago, and they took a puppy as well. And so now every once in a while, these two puppies who grew up together in the same litter, they get together at one of our houses and vigorously play the entire time. Now they're about a year and a half old now. They've had their procedures because we don't want any more puppies. Uh, and they're probably about as big as they're going to get. Our dog is six pounds. That's a picture of her there. And my mother and father-in-law's dog is about 18 pounds. <laughs> and oddly enough, our smaller dog often initiates the play battles as much as the larger dog does. And if they're together the whole day, except for a few short breaks, they do this almost the entire time. Now, when we're at the big dog's house, they get playing a little too rough, maybe because he's a little more territorial with his own space. And while we might be talking over a meal, we'll be listening to them playing and growling with each other, and then our dog's growls will get a little bit higher pitched, and then a little bit more higher pitched, and then, yep, and then we'll know we got to intervene in some way. And usually all we need to do is call out the name of the bigger dog, and he'll stop, and he'll give us one of those wide-eyed, dumb looks like, what? And they'll calm it down for a little while. And so it's puzzling, really, how two dogs from the same breed and parents and litter can be so different in size, six pounds versus 18 pounds. It doesn't seem fair, really, but that's the way it often is in the world, right? It's big dogs versus little dogs. In the times of the prophet Isaiah, 
Israel was a little dog nation surrounded by big dog empires. The superpower to the south, Egypt, to the north, Assyria, and to the northeast across the Fertile Crescent, Babylon, at various times in history, all vying for power. And from time to time, it would affect what Dr. Beck calls Israel, the land in between. Israel always had a special place in God's heart and plans of salvation and redemption for the world, even though they were often outsized, outgunned, and even sometimes on the outs with God because of their sin in his mercy, the Lord had preserved his people against these world superpowers. However, there were times when the divine help was slow to come because of Israel's need to learn from the consequences of their own actions. Even in the ancient times of the prophet Isaiah, Israel had already had a long history of this covenant relationship of trust and faith in the Lord, which we still read and learn from today in our own lives, in our own battles. Out of their fear of the other nations, Israel wanted to trust in having a king and an army of their own rather than trusting in God to lead and protect them. Their first king, King Saul, was a disaster. The next king, King David, is known as the greatest king of Israel because of how the nation thrived the most under his leadership. But even then, it was not perfect and it was not lasting. Here at the time of Isaiah chapter 11, it was many years and nine kings later since David reigned. According to Isaiah 1.1, it was during the times of King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah in which Isaiah is writing. The big dog that posed the greatest threat to them at the time was Assyria. The scriptures say God chose not to intervene with their defeating and vanquishing 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel, the ones that lived in the northern part of the nation. Israel was not doing well at the time. And that's why in verse 1, it refers to Israel as but a stump of Jesse and not a thriving tree. But that was not the end of the story. For you see, old stumps can create some great soil that can shoot new life in which it can emerge. Isaiah 11.1 1 says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. There's three kinds of readers of books. There's the slow readers who go back lots of times to read reread sentences to be sure they didn't miss anything. There's the fast readers who quickly move through it and they're not worried about if they miss some details along the way. And then there's the jumpers. They skip around, especially to the end, to see if the book is really worth reading all the way through. And here in Isaiah 11, the prophet is taking the strategy of the jumper for the sake of offering hope and showing the end at the beginning. It's giving a picture of the Messiah, who the Messiah was yet to be in the kind of kingdom that he would usher in. Isaiah offered them hope that they could have, therefore, in their present time. As bad as things can get sometimes, when the big dogs of life's problems are on us and we are in the thick of it, if we have even a little bit of hope, a word that assures us that, th that things are going to get better eventually, it can help us to push through the fear and the gloom that overshadows our thoughts and feelings at such times. Here the words of the prophet seem to say to them, you thought the times of King David were good. I've got another thing coming that is far greater than you can even imagine. Let me tell you about the Messiah, the shoot who is going to spring up, my chosen king, who is going to be greater than all the big dogs in your life such that you won't need to fear them anymore. 
Actually, he calls them wolves and lions and bears and snakes. But you get the idea. Unlike the kings of the earth, the Messiah would be one in whom the spirit of the Lord rests, who had godly knowledge and wisdom that goes far beyond what the human eye can see or even the human mind understand. His relationship with God and the power of his words would be the primary instruments of his power. He would focus not on conquering the other nations around them, but justly ruling and caring for his own people and yet still reaching all the nations through the power of his word and not the sword. The kind of kingdom this king would rule over is one in which danger is eliminated and his people could dwell in safety and the dangerous conflicts that has long plagued human history would cease. This picture of a deliverer of God's people is a startling and puzzling one to us because it's very different from the ways of the world uh, as we know it. Isaiah 55, 9 says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so while we may not totally understand this picture of the type of safe and peaceful world that the prophet says God's Messiah will usher in, where our current enemies, either human or animal, will still be present, but will not be a threat or a danger. The Lord, through Isaiah, seems to say to his people, allow me to work with your imaginations and stretch the boundaries of what you thought was even possible based on your limited past experience and knowledge. And trust me, trust me with your future. A better time is coming. He also says his chosen instruments in accomplishing this will will be his Messiah and his word. In verse 9, it says, They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The picture of world peace here is not one that's gained by military conquest or politics or diplomatic relations or humans simply envisioning a better world and making it happen without the involvement or assistance from God. In this movement of saving and redeeming the world, the Messiah and his words are the instruments of spiritual victory over all the peoples and nations of the earth. The Messiah is Savior, and this is only possible because the kingdom of heaven comes near to us in him. One day, the kingdom of heaven, in spiritual ways, will overcome the kingdoms of this world with a far better one, in which there is only one king, God's Messiah. His word, his teachings, the basis of the doctrines of the church are what shall establish the boundaries in which the spirit of God will run wild with love, creativity, grace, saving the souls of people and giving people a new future and building up a different kind of world. It's the kind of work, I believe, if we have the eyes of faith, can see happening around us all the time here at Christ Church as we bundle up 1,200 presents and send them to Mexico. As we have an angel tree that is sending gifts for people uh, who are in need all around our community. As our work takes uh, gifts of love and the word of God to places like Haiti and Uganda. Verse 10 reads, In that day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples, the nations will rally to him. Roots normally come before trees and stumps and shoots or branches. Uh, How can the Messiah be both a root as well as a shoot from that stump? 
This is a question that Jesus himself, in a way, God's Messiah, brought to the Pharisees to correct their false expectations of who the Messiah would be. In Matthew 22, he says to them, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? There's something ironic about the Messiah uh, talking about who, whose son the Messiah should be to the Pharisees in this discussion. But as John 1, 1 tells us, God's Messiah is both before Jesse and after Jesse, both the root and the shoot. And David, as he records, and, and John, as he records it, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Isaiah 11.10 again, In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. God's Messiah himself, the person, will be a banner for the people to rally to. And his word, the instrument of spiritual advance unto all the nations, what does it mean his place of rest or dwelling place will be glorious? Now, this may be getting ahead of ourselves a little bit for the Advent season, but didn't Jesus talk about going ahead to prepare a place for his disciples right before the crucifixion? A place where the disciples couldn't follow him at the time? Was not the resting place for the body of Jesus after the crucifixion? transformed from a tomb of death to an empty showcase of the power of God to raise the dead and show with power that Jesus Christ is both Messiah and Lord. Were not angels both at his birth and at his resurrection in glory declaring Jesus Christ as God's Messiah? Did not Peter at Pentecost, connect the Davidic prophecy of the Messiah with Jesus when he said of David, but he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, or Messiah. As believers in this Advent season, we live on the other side of the cross and resurrection. We can place our hope. In Jesus because of what we know. But even in the days of Isaiah, they too knew because of the inspired word of God given to them through the prophets that God's Messiah was coming, a son of David and a heavenly king of a completely different nature. Jesus said in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world, if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Through him and his word, the kingdom of heaven may overlap with these earthly ones in him. The word that captures this expectancy for us today is hope. Hope in the Messiah and the redemption that he has won in working in us and through us and all around us in this world that he created and is in the process of redeeming. Hope is the name of our little six-pound dog who demonstrates great courage and faith in not backing down from her 18-pound brother Barnabas 
who vastly outmatches her with strength and size every time. Hope is also the name of our second Advent candle, uh, which we lit today. The light of hope, which this candle represents, shines even when the picture of our lives or our families or our relationships are far from the picture of perfect health or the place that we may, we may really want them to be. And like Assyria threatening the well-being of God's people of Israel from the north, who is scrambling to survive, there are any number of things going on in our lives that would threaten to crowd out hope in us and replace it with fear and gloom. But even when we seem to be losing ground in this temporal battle between the goodness of God and the evils of this world in all of its forms, and even when fear, depression, and doubt clouds the way, the light of hope in Christ can still shine through and again invite us to hold on, to hang on, and remind us help is on the way. God's been with us in our yesterdays, will be with us in the present and all our tomorrows. Wherever we are, whatever we're facing, we can seek the Lord in prayer and trust in his presence and love for us. Sometimes that prayer for intervention can be with thoughts and sighs too deep for words, and it can even be a yip. Because of God's righteous one, the Messiah, and his work and offering on our behalf, we will be heard and we will, in time, be saved. Ultimately, his will will be done and nothing can separate us from his love. We may lose some battles, but in Christ, the victory of the war over evil is surely won. He will come and make all things right. And when we know a time and a king like Isaiah describes in this passage for us today, we know that the pains of life and the apparent enemies that they come through, that they will be bearable for us. For the hymn, O Come, I Come, Emmanuel, which we sang earlier, it has an alternate version of verse 2 that goes like this. O come thou root of Jesse's tree and ensign of thy people be before the ruler's silent fall. All peoples on thy mercy call. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Amen.